chapter 10. For we must never forget, dear brothers, what happened to our people in the wilderness long ago. God guided them by sending a cloud that moved along ahead of them. And he brought them all safely through the waters of the Red Sea. This might be called their baptism, baptized both in sea and cloud as followers of Moses, their commitment to him as their leader. And by a miracle, God sent them food to eat and water to drink there in the desert. They drank the water that Christ gave them. He was there with them as a mighty rock of spiritual refreshment. Yet after all this, most of them did not obey God, and he destroyed them in the wilderness. From this lesson, we are warned that we must not desire evil things as they did, nor worship idols as they did. The scriptures tell us the people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to dance in worship of the golden calf. Another lesson for us is what happened when some of them sinned with other men's wives and 23,000 fell dead in one day. And don't try the Lord's patience. They did and died from snake bites. And don't murmur against God and his dealings with you as some of them did. For that is why God sent his angel to destroy them. All these things happen to them as examples, as object lessons to us, to warn us against doing the same things. They were written down so that we could read about them and learn from them in these last days as the world nears its end. So be careful. If you are thinking, oh, I would never behave like that, let this be a warning to you, for you too may fall into sin. But remember this. The wrong desires that come into your life aren't anything new and different. Many others have faced exactly the same problems before you, and no temptation is irresistible. You can trust God to keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it, for he has promised this and will do what he says. He will show you how to escape temptation's power so that you can bear up patiently against it. So, dear friends, carefully avoid idol worship of every kind. You are intelligent people. Look now and see for yourselves whether what I am about to say is true. When we ask the Lord's blessing upon our drinking from the cup of wine at the Lord's table, this means, doesn't it, that all who drink it are sharing together the blessing of Christ's blood. And when we break off pieces of the bread from the loaf to eat there together, this shows that we are sharing together in the benefits of his body. No matter how many of us there are, we all eat from the same loaf, showing that we are all parts of the one body of Christ. And the Jewish people, all who eat the sacrifices, are united by that act. What am I trying to say? Am I saying that the idols to whom the heathen bring sacrifices are really alive and are real gods, and that these sacrifices are of some value? No, not at all. What I am saying is that those who offer food to these idols are united together in sacrificing to demons, Certainly not to God. And I don't want any of you to be partners with demons when you eat the same food along with the heathen that has been offered to these idols. You cannot drink from the cup at the Lord's table and at Satan's table too. You cannot eat bread both at the Lord's table and at Satan's table. What? Are you tempting the Lord to be angry with you? Are you stronger than he is? You are certainly free to eat food offered to idols if you want to. It's not against God's laws to eat such meat. But that doesn't mean that you should go ahead and do it. It may be perfectly legal, but it may not be best and helpful. Don't think only of yourself. Try to think of the other fellow, too, and what is best for him. Here's what you should do. Take any meat you want that is sold at the market. Don't ask whether or not it was offered to idols, lest the answer hurt your conscience. For the earth and every good thing in it belongs to the Lord and is yours to enjoy. If someone who isn't a Christian asks you out to dinner, go ahead, accept the invitation if you want to. Eat whatever is on the table and don't ask any questions about it. Then you won't know whether or not it had been used as a sacrifice to idols, and you won't risk having a bad conscience over eating it. But if someone warns you that this meat has been offered to idols, then don't eat it for the sake of the man who told you and of his conscience. In this case, his feeling about it is the important thing, not yours. But why, you may ask, must I be guided and limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for the food and enjoy it, why let someone spoil everything just because he thinks I am wrong? Well, I'll tell you why. It is because you must do everything for the glory of God, even your eating and drinking. So don't be a stumbling block to anyone, whether they are Jews or Gentiles or Christians. That is the plan I follow, too. I try to please everyone in everything I do, not doing what I like or what is best for me, but what is best for them, so that they may be saved.
chapter 11. And you should follow my example, just as I follow Christ's. I am so glad, dear brothers, that you have been remembering and doing everything I taught you. But there is one matter I want to remind you about. That a wife is responsible to her husband. Her husband is responsible to Christ, and Christ is responsible to God. That is why, if a man refuses to remove his hat while praying or preaching, he dishonors Christ. And that is why a woman who publicly prays or prophesies without a covering on her head dishonors her husband, for her covering is a sign of her subjection to him. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, then she should cut off all her hair. And if it is shameful for a woman to have her head shaved, then she should wear a covering. But a man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for his hat is a sign of subjection to men. God's glory is man, made in his image, and man's glory is the woman. The first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came out of man. And Adam, the first man, was not made for Eve's benefit, but Eve was made for Adam. So a woman should wear a covering on her head as a sign that she is under man's authority, a fact for all the angels to notice and rejoice in. But remember that in God's plan, men and women need each other. For although the first woman came out of man, all men have been born from women ever since, and both men and women come from God, their creator. What do you yourselves really think about this? Is it right for a woman to pray in public without covering her head? Doesn't even instinct itself teach us that women's heads should be covered? For women are proud of their long hair, while a man with long hair tends to be ashamed. But if anyone wants to argue about this, all I can say is that we never teach anything else than this, that a woman should wear a covering when prophesying or praying publicly in the church, and all the churches feel the same way about it. Next on my list of items to write you about is something else I cannot agree with, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together for your communion services. Everyone keeps telling me about the arguing that goes on in these meetings and the divisions developing among you, and I can just about believe it. But I suppose you feel this is necessary so that you who are always right will become known and recognized. When you come together to eat, it isn't the Lord's Supper you're eating, but your own. For I am told that everyone hastily gobbles all the food he can without waiting to share with the others, so that one doesn't get enough and goes hungry, while another has too much to drink and gets drunk. What, is this really true? Can't you do your eating and drinking at home to avoid disgracing the church and shaming those who are poor and can bring no food? What am I supposed to say about these things? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly do not. For this is what the Lord himself has said about his table, and I have passed it on to you before that on the night when Judas betrayed him, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new agreement between God and you that has been established and set in motion by my blood. Do this in remembrance of me whenever you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are retelling the message of the Lord's death, that he has died for you. Do this until he comes again. So if anyone eats this bread and drinks from this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he is guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why a man should examine himself carefully before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. For if he eats the bread and drinks from the cup unworthily, not thinking about the body of Christ and what it means, he is eating and drinking God's judgment upon himself for he is trifling with the death of Christ. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if you carefully examine yourselves before eating, you will not need to be judged and punished. Yet when we are judged and punished by the Lord, it is so that we will not be condemned with the rest of the world. So, dear brothers, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, the communion service, wait for each other. If anyone is really hungry, he should eat at home so that he won't bring punishment upon himself when you meet together. I'll talk to you about the other matters after I arrive. Chapter 12. And now, brothers, I want to write about the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives to each of you, for I don't want any misunderstanding about them. You will remember that before you became Christians, you went around from one idol to another, not one of which could speak a single word. But now you are meeting people who claim to speak messages from the Spirit of God. How can you know whether they are really inspired by God or whether they are fakes? Here is the test. No one speaking by the power of the Spirit of God can curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord and really mean it unless the Holy Spirit is helping him. Now God gives us many kinds of special abilities. 
but it is the same Holy Spirit who is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service to God, but it is the same Lord we are serving. There are many ways in which God works in our lives, but it is the same God who does the work in and through all of us who are his. The Holy Spirit displays God's power through each of us as a means of helping the entire church. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Someone else may be especially good at studying and teaching, and this is his gift from the same Spirit. He gives special faith to another, and to someone else, the power to heal the sick. He gives power for doing miracles to some, and to others, power to prophesy and preach. He gives someone else the power to know whether evil spirits are speaking through those who claim to be giving God's messages, or whether it is really the Spirit of God who is speaking. Still another person is able to speak in languages he never learned, and others, who do not know the language either, are given power to understand what he is saying. It is the same and only Holy Spirit who gives all these gifts and powers, deciding which each one of us should have. Our bodies have many parts, but the many parts make up only one body when they are all put together. So it is with the body of Christ. Each of us is a part of the one body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But the Holy Spirit has fitted us all together into one body. We have been baptized into Christ's body by the one Spirit, and have all been given that same Holy Spirit. Yes, the body has many parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And what would you think if you heard an ear say, I am not part of the body because I am only an ear, not an eye? Would that make it any less a part of the body? Suppose the whole body were an eye, then how would you hear? Or if your whole body were just one big ear, how could you smell anything? But that isn't the way God has made us. He has made many parts for our bodies and has put each part just where he wants it. What a strange thing a body would be if it had only one part. So he has made many parts, but still there is only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And some of the parts that seem weakest and least important are really the most necessary. Yes, we are especially glad to have some parts that seem rather odd. And we carefully protect from the eyes of others those parts that should not be seen. While, of course, the parts that may be seen do not require this special care. So God has put the body together in such a way that extra honor and care are given to those parts that might otherwise seem less important. This makes for happiness among the parts, so that the parts have the same care for each other that they do for themselves. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Now here's what I'm trying to say. All of you together are the one body of Christ, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. Here is a list of some of the parts he has placed in his church, which is his body. Apostles, prophets, those who preach God's word, teachers, those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who can get others to work together, those who speak in languages they have never learned. Is everyone an apostle? Of course not. Is everyone a preacher? No. Are all teachers? Does everyone have the power to do miracles? Can everyone heal the sick? Of course not. Does God give all of us the ability to speak in languages we've never learned? Can just anyone understand and translate what those are saying who have that gift of foreign speech? No, but try your best to have the more important of these gifts. First, however, let me tell you about something else that is better than any of them. Chapter 13. If I had the gift of being able to speak in other languages without learning them, and could speak in every language there is in all of heaven and earth, but didn't love others, I would only be making noise. If I had the gift of prophecy and knew all about what is going to happen in the future, knew everything about everything, but didn't love others, what good would it do? Even if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move, I would still be worth nothing at all without love. If I gave everything I have to poor people, and if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but didn't love others, it would be of no value whatever. Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him 
no matter what the cost. You will always believe in it, always expect the best of it, and always stand your ground in defending it. All the special gifts and powers from God will someday come to an end, but love goes on forever. Someday, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, these gifts will disappear. Now we know so little, even with our special gifts, and the preaching of those most gifted is still so poor. But when we have been made perfect and complete, then the need for these inadequate special gifts will come to an end, and they will disappear. It's like this. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child does. But when I became a man, my thoughts grew far beyond those of my childhood. And now I have put away the childish things. In the same way, we can see and understand only a little about God now, as if we were peering at his reflection in a poor mirror. But someday, we are going to see him in his completeness, face to face. Now all that I know is hazy and blurred. But then, I will see everything clearly, just as clearly as God sees into my heart right now. There are three things that remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Chapter 14. Let love be your greatest aim. Nevertheless, ask also for the special abilities the Holy Spirit gives, and especially the gift of prophecy, being able to preach the messages of God. But if your gift is that of being able to speak in tongues, that is, to speak in languages you haven't learned, you will be talking to God, but not to others, since they won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be a secret. But one who prophesies, preaching the messages of God, is helping others grow in the Lord, encouraging and comforting them. So a person speaking in tongues helps himself grow spiritually, but one who prophesies, preaching messages from God, helps the entire church grow in holiness and happiness. I wish you all had the gift of speaking in tongues. But even more, I wish you were all able to prophesy, preaching God's messages, for that is a greater and more useful power than to speak in unknown languages. Unless, of course, you can tell everyone afterwards what you were saying, so that they can get some good out of it, too. Dear friends, even if I myself should come to you talking in some language you don't understand, how would that help you? But if I speak plainly what God has revealed to me, and tell you the things I know, and what is going to happen, and the great truths of God's Word, that is what you need. That is what will help you. Even musical instruments, the flute, for instance, or the harp, are examples of the need for speaking in plain, simple English, rather than in unknown languages. For no one will recognize the tune the flute is playing unless each note is sounded clearly. And if the army bugler doesn't play the right notes, how will the soldiers know that they are being called to battle? In the same way, if you talk to a person in some language he doesn't understand, how will he know what you mean? You might as well be talking to an empty room. I suppose that there are hundreds of different languages in the world, and all are excellent for those who understand them. But to me, they mean nothing. A person talking to me in one of these languages will be a stranger to me, and I will be a stranger to him. Since you are so anxious to have special gifts from the Holy Spirit, ask him for the very best for those that will be of real help to the whole church. If someone is given the gift of speaking in unknown tongues, he should pray also for the gift of knowing what he has said, so that he can tell people afterwards, plainly. For if I pray in a language I don't understand, my spirit is praying, but I don't know what I am saying. Well then, what shall I do? I will do both. I will pray in unknown tongues and also in ordinary language that everyone understands. I will sing in unknown tongues and also in ordinary language so that I can understand the praise I am giving. For if you praise and thank God with the Spirit alone, speaking in another language, how can those who don't understand you be praising God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't know what you are saying? You will be giving thanks very nicely, no doubt, but the other people present won't be helped. I thank God that I speak in tongues privately more than any of the rest of you. But in public worship, I would much rather speak five words that people can understand and be helped by than 10,000 words while speaking in tongues in an unknown language. Dear brothers, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent babies when it comes to planning evil, but be men of intelligence in understanding matters of this kind. We are told in the ancient scriptures that God would send men from other lands to speak in foreign languages to his people, but even then they would not listen. So you see that being able to speak in tongues is not a help to God's children, but is to interest the unsaved. However, prophecy, preaching the deep truths of God, is what the Christians need, and unbelievers aren't yet ready for it. 
Even so, if an unsaved person or someone who doesn't have these gifts comes to church and hears you all talking in other languages, he is likely to think you are crazy. But if you prophesy, preaching God's word, even though such preaching is mostly for believers, and an unsaved person or a new Christian comes in who does not understand about these things, all these sermons will convince him of the fact that he is a sinner, and his conscience will be pricked by everything he hears. As he listens, his secret thoughts will be laid bare, and he will fall down on his knees and worship God, declaring that God is really there among you. Well, my brothers, let's add up what I am saying. When you meet together, some will sing, another will teach or tell some special information God has given him, or speak in an unknown language, or tell what someone else is saying who is speaking in the unknown language. But everything that is done must be useful to all and build them up in the Lord. No more than two or three should speak in an unknown language, and they must speak one at a time, and someone must be ready to interpret what they are saying. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must not speak out loud. They must talk silently to themselves and to God in the unknown language, but not publicly. Two or three may prophesy, one at a time if they have the gift, while all the others listen. But if while someone is prophesying, someone else receives a message or idea from the Lord, the one who is speaking should stop. In this way, all who have the gift of prophecy can speak, one after the other, and everyone will learn and be encouraged and helped. Remember that a person who has a message from God has the power to stop himself or wait his turn. God is not one who likes things to be disorderly and upset. He likes harmony, and he finds it in all the other churches. Women should be silent during the church meetings. They are not to take part in the discussion, for they are subordinate to men, as the scriptures also declare. If they have any questions to ask, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for women to express their opinions in church meetings. You disagree? And do you think that the knowledge of God's will begins and ends with you Corinthians? Well, you are mistaken. You who claim to have the gift of prophecy or any other special ability from the Holy Spirit should be the first to realize that what I am saying is a commandment from the Lord himself. But if anyone still disagrees, well, we will leave him in his ignorance. So, my fellow believers, long to be prophets, so that you can preach God's message plainly and never say it is wrong to speak in tongues. However, be sure that everything is done properly in a good and orderly way. Chapter 15. Now let me remind you, brothers, of what the gospel really is, for it has not changed. It is the same good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and still do now, for your faith is squarely built upon this wonderful message. And it is this good news that saves you if you still firmly believe it, unless, of course, you never really believed it in the first place. I passed on to you right from the first what had been told to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said he would, and that he was buried and that three days afterwards he arose from the grave, just as the prophets foretold. He was seen by Peter, and later by the rest of the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 Christian brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died by now. Then James saw him, and later all the apostles. Last of all, I saw him too, long after the others, as though I had been born almost too late for this. For I am the least worthy of all the apostles. And I shouldn't even be called an apostle at all after the way I treated the church of God. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out such kindness and grace upon me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than all the other apostles. Yet actually I wasn't doing it, but God working in me to bless me. It makes no difference who worked the hardest, I or they. The important thing is that we preached the gospel to you, and you believed it. But tell me this. Since you believe what we preach, that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that dead people will never come back to life again? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ must still be dead. And if he is still dead, then all our preaching is useless, and your trust in God is empty, worthless, hopeless. And we apostles are all liars because we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. And of course that isn't true if the dead do not come back to life again. If they don't, then Christ is still dead. And you are very foolish to keep on trusting God to save you, and you are still under condemnation for your sins. In that case, all Christians who have died are lost. And if being a Christian is of value to us only now in this life, we are the most miserable of creatures. But the fact is that Christ did actually rise from the dead and has become the first of millions who will come back to life again someday. 
death came into the world because of what one man, Adam, did. And it is because of what this other man, Christ, has done that now there is the resurrection from the dead. Everyone dies because all of us are related to Adam, being members of his sinful race. And wherever there is sin, death results. But all who are related to Christ will rise again. Each, however, in his own turn. Christ rose first, then when Christ comes back, all his people will become alive again. After that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father, having put down all enemies of every kind. For Christ will be king until he has defeated all his enemies, including the last enemy, death. This too must be defeated and ended. For the rule and authority over all things has been given to Christ by his Father. Except, of course, Christ does not rule over the Father himself, who gave him this power to rule. When Christ has finally won the battle against all his enemies, then he, the Son of God, will put himself also under his Father's orders, so that God, who has given him the victory over everything else, will be utterly supreme. If the dead will not come back to life again, then what point is there in people being baptized for those who are gone? Why do it unless you believe that the dead will someday rise again? And why should we ourselves be continually risking our lives, facing death hour by hour? For it is a fact that I face death daily. That is as true as my pride in your growth in the Lord. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those men of Ephesus, if it was only for what I gain in this life down here? If we will never live again after we die, then we might as well go and have ourselves a good time. Let us eat, drink, and be merry. What's the difference? For tomorrow we die, and that ends everything. Don't be fooled by those who say such things. If you listen to them, you will start acting like them. Get some sense and quit your sinning. For to your shame I say it, some of you are not even Christians at all and have never really known God. But someone may ask, how will the dead be brought back to life again? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. You will find the answer in your own garden. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And when the green shoot comes up out of the seed, it is very different from the seed you first planted. For all you put into the ground is a dry little seed of wheat or whatever it is you are planting. Then God gives it a beautiful new body, just the kind he wants it to have. A different kind of plant grows from each kind of seed. And just as there are different kinds of seeds and plants, so also there are different kinds of flesh. Humans, animals, fish, and birds are all different. The angels in heaven have bodies far different from ours, and the beauty and the glory of their bodies is different from the beauty and the glory of ours. The sun has one kind of glory, while the moon and stars have another kind. And the stars differ from each other in their beauty and brightness. In the same way, our earthly bodies which die and decay are different from the bodies we shall have when we come back to life again, for they will never die. The bodies we have now embarrass us, for they become sick and die but they will be full of glory when we come back to life again. Yes, they are weak, dying bodies now, but when we live again, they will be full of strength. They are just human bodies at death, but when they come back to life, they will be superhuman bodies. For just as there are natural human bodies, there are also supernatural spiritual bodies. The scriptures tell us that the first man, Adam, was given a natural human body, but Christ is more than that, for he was life-giving spirit. First, then, we have these human bodies, and later on, God gives us spiritual, heavenly bodies. Adam was made from the dust of the earth, but Christ came from heaven above. Every human being has a body just like Adam's, made of dust, but all who become Christ's will have the same kind of body as his, a body from heaven. Just as each of us now has a body like Adam's, so we shall someday have a body like Christ's. I tell you this, my brothers, an earthly body made of flesh and blood cannot get into God's kingdom. These perishable bodies of ours are not the right kind to live forever. But I am telling you this strange and wonderful secret. We shall not all die, but we shall all be given new bodies. It will all happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For there will be a trumpet blast from the sky, and all the Christians who have died will suddenly become alive with new bodies that will never, never die. And then we who are still alive shall suddenly have new bodies too. For our earthly bodies, the ones we have now that can die, must be transformed into heavenly bodies that cannot perish but will live forever. When this happens, then at last this scripture will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. 
Oh, death, where then your victory? Where then your sting? For sin, the sting that causes death, will all be gone, and the law which reveals our sins will no longer be our judge. How we thank God for all of this. It is he who makes us victorious through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, my dear brothers, since future victory is sure, be strong and steady, always abounding in the Lord's work. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever wasted, as it would be if there were no resurrection. Chapter 16. Now, here are the directions about the money you are collecting to send to the Christians in Jerusalem. And by the way, these are the same directions I gave to the churches in Galatia. Every Sunday, each of you should put aside something from what you have earned during the week and use it for this offering. The amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will send your loving gift with a letter to Jerusalem to be taken there by trustworthy messengers you yourselves will choose. And if it seems wise for me to go along too, then we can travel together. I am coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia first, but I will be staying there only for a little while. It could be that I will stay longer with you, perhaps all winter, and then you can send me on to my next destination. This time I don't want to make just a passing visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while, if the Lord will let me. I will be staying here at Ephesus until the holiday of Pentecost, for there is a wide open door for me to preach and teach here. So much is happening, but there are many enemies. If Timothy comes, make him feel at home, for he is doing the Lord's work just as I am. Don't let anyone despise or ignore him because he is young, but send him back to me happy with his time among you. I am looking forward to seeing him soon, along with the others who are returning. I begged Apollos to visit you along with the others, but he thought that it was not at all God's will for him to go now. He will be seeing you later on when he has the opportunity. Keep your eyes open for spiritual danger. Stand true to the Lord. Act like men. Be strong. And whatever you do, do it with kindness and love. Do you remember Stephanus and his family? They were the first to become Christians in Greece, and they are spending their lives helping and serving Christians everywhere. Please follow their instructions and do everything you can to help them, as well as all others like them who work hard at your side with such real devotion. I am so glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus have arrived here for a visit. They have been making up for the help you aren't here to give me. They have cheered me greatly and have been a wonderful encouragement to me, as I am sure they were to you too. I hope you properly appreciate the work of such men as these. The churches here in Asia send you their loving greetings. Aquila and Priscilla send you their love, and so do all the others who meet in their home for their church service. All the friends here have asked me to say hello to you for them, and give each other a loving handshake when you meet. I will write these final words of this letter with my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Lord Jesus, come. May the love and favor of the Lord Jesus Christ rest upon you. My love to all of you, for we all belong to Christ Jesus. Sincerely, Paul. 2 Corinthians, Chapter 1. Dear friends, this letter is from me, Paul appointed by God to be Jesus Christ's messenger, and from our dear brother Timothy. We are writing to all of you Christians there in Corinth and throughout Greece. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ mightily bless each one of you and give you peace. What a wonderful God we have. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy, and the one who so wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. And why does he do this? so that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them this same help and comfort God has given us. You can be sure that the more we undergo sufferings for Christ, the more he will shower us with his comfort and encouragement. We are in deep trouble for bringing you God's comfort and salvation, but in our trouble God had comforted us, and this too to help you, to show you from our personal experience how God will tenderly comfort you when you undergo these same sufferings. He will give you the strength to endure. I think you ought to know, dear brothers, about the hard time we went through in Asia. We were really crushed and overwhelmed and feared we would never live through it. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. 
but that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God, who alone could save us. For he can even raise the dead. And he did help us, and saved us from a terrible death. Yes, and we expect him to do it again and again. But you must help us too by praying for us. For much thanks and praise will go to God from you who see his wonderful answers to your prayers for our safety. We are so glad that we can say with utter honesty that in all our dealings we have been pure and sincere, quietly depending upon the Lord for his help, and not on our own skills. And that is even more true, if possible, about the way we have acted toward you. My letters have been straightforward and sincere. Nothing is written between the lines. And even though you don't know me very well, I hope someday you will, I want you to try to accept me and be proud of me, as you already are to some extent, just as I shall be of you on that day when our Lord Jesus comes back again. It was because I was so sure of your understanding and trust that I planned to stop and see you on my way to Macedonia, as well as afterwards when I returned, so that I could be a double blessing to you and so that you could send me on my way to Judea. Then why, you may be asking, did I change my plan? Hadn't I really made up my mind yet? Or am I like a man of the world who says yes when he really means no? Never. As surely as God is true, I am not that sort of person. My yes means yes. Timothy and Silvanus and I have been telling you about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He isn't the one to say yes when he means no. He always does exactly what he says. He carries out and fulfills all of God's promises, no matter how many of them there are. And we have told everyone how faithful he is, giving glory to his name. It is this God who has made you and me into faithful Christians and commissioned us apostles to preach the good news. He has put his brand upon us, his mark of ownership, and given us his Holy Spirit in our hearts as guarantee that we belong to him and as the first installment of all that he is going to give us. I call upon this God to witness against me if I am not telling the absolute truth. The reason I haven't come to visit you yet is that I don't want to sadden you with a severe rebuke. When I come, although I can't do much to help your faith, for it is strong already, I want to be able to do something about your joy. I want to make you happy, not sad. Chapter 2 No, I said to myself, I won't do it. I'll not make them unhappy with another painful visit. For if I make you sad, who is going to make me happy? You are the ones to do it, and how can you if I cause you pain? That is why I wrote as I did in my last letter, so that you will get things straightened out before I come. Then when I do come, I will not be made sad by the very ones who ought to give me greatest joy. I felt sure that your happiness was so bound up in mine that you would not be happy either unless I came with joy. Oh, how I hated to write that letter. It almost broke my heart. And I tell you honestly that I cried over it. I didn't want to hurt you, but I had to show you how very much I loved you and cared about what was happening to you. Remember that the man I wrote about who caused all the trouble has not caused sorrow to me as much as to all the rest of you, though I certainly have my share in it too. I don't want to be harder on him than I should. He has been punished enough by your united disapproval. Now it is time to forgive him and comfort him. Otherwise, he may become so bitter and discouraged that he won't be able to recover. Please show him now that you still do love him very much. I wrote to you as I did so that I could find out how far you would go in obeying me. When you forgive anyone, I do too. And whatever I have forgiven to the extent that this affected me too has been by Christ's authority and for your good. A further reason for forgiveness is to keep from being outsmarted by Satan, for we know what he is trying to do. Well, when I got as far as the city of Troas, the Lord gave me tremendous opportunities to preach the gospel. But Titus, my dear brother, wasn't there to meet me, and I couldn't rest, wondering where he was and what had happened to him. So I said goodbye and went right on to Macedonia to try to find him. But thanks be to God, for through what Christ has done, he has triumphed over us, so that now wherever we go, he uses us to tell others about the Lord and to spread the gospel like a sweet perfume. As far as God is concerned, there is a sweet, wholesome fragrance in our lives. It is the fragrance of Christ within us, an aroma to both the saved and the unsaved all around us. To those who are not being saved, we seem a fearful smell of death and doom, while to those who know Christ, we are a life-giving perfume. But who is adequate for such a task as this? 
Only those who, like ourselves, are men of integrity, sent by God, speaking with Christ's power, with God's eye upon us. We are not like those hucksters, there are many of them, whose idea in getting out the gospel is to make a good living out of it. Chapter 3. Are we beginning to be like those false teachers of yours who must tell you all about themselves and bring long letters of recommendation with them? I think you hardly need someone's letter to tell you about us, do you? And we don't need a recommendation from you, either. The only letter I need is you yourselves. By looking at the good change in your hearts, everyone can see that we have done a good work among you. They can see that you are a letter from Christ, written by us. It is not a letter written with pen and ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not one carved on stone, but in human hearts. We dare to say these good things about ourselves only because of our great trust in God through Christ, that he will help us to be true to what we say, and not because we think we can do anything of lasting value by ourselves. Our only power and success comes from God. He is the one who has helped us tell others his new agreement to save them. We do not tell them that they must obey every law of God or die, but we tell them there is life for them from the Holy Spirit. The old way, trying to be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments, ends in death. In the new way, the Holy Spirit gives them life. Yet that old system of law that led to death began with such glory that people could not bear to look at Moses' face. For as he gave them God's law to obey, his face shone out with the very glory of God, though the brightness was already fading away. Shall we not expect far greater glory in these days when the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the plan that leads to doom was glorious, much more glorious is the plan that makes men right with God. In fact, that first glory, as it's shown from Moses' face, is worth nothing at all in comparison with the overwhelming glory of the new agreement. So if the old system that faded into nothing was full of heavenly glory, the glory of God's new plan for our salvation is certainly far greater, for it is eternal. Since we know that this new glory will never go away, we can preach with great boldness, and not as Moses did, who put a veil over his face so that the Israeli could not see the glory fade away. Not only Moses' face was veiled, but his people's minds and understanding were veiled and blinded too. Even now, when the scripture is read, it seems as though Jewish hearts and minds are covered by a thick veil because they cannot see and understand the real meaning of the scriptures. For this veil of misunderstanding can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are blind, and they think that obeying the Ten Commandments is the way to be saved. 